some of the people at epic pulled me aside they were like hey we saw the tutorial that you did so it's kind of crazy how like one tutorial kind of spread into what i'm doing today you know let's push the boundaries play with color play with compositing play with frame rates and let's just really push the limits because to me that's the stuff ai is not going to be able to replicate and that's how we're going to be able to keep pushing forward creatively and keep the jobs you probably know our guest if you haven't seen his tutorials before i can almost guarantee you've seen his work he has over 15 years of experience making stunning visuals in tv shows movies he's worked in vr he's just all around a fantastic artist and i'm not gonna lie i may or may not be fanboying a little bit i'm still somewhat speechless and excited without further ado the man who needs no introduction well let's just get to the episode we have with us today the amazing win bush how's it going man what up what up appreciate <laughs> you guys having me on the xr podcast yeah. i know we've been trying to get this going for a while so i we have definitely thank we you guys have. for being patient with my schedule and everything lately it's been been a crazy year dude absolutely man well i mean you're so busy so for you to just be able to make time that is just we're floored we're floored it means so much for anybody who somehow doesn't know you can you just give us a little bit of an introduction of what you know what you do and a little bit about yourself yeah so for those that don't know my name fully is jonathan wimbush i'm a motion graphics artist based out of southern california i've been down here working professionally since about 2006 so like i've worked with marvel dc warner brothers um happy madison doing mainly theatrical titles and tv shows maybe a video game here and there and then i know you mentioned the metaverse i, I think i worked on a metaverse i don't know like <laughs> that's always a weird thing you know getting tossed around these days but yeah basically if it has a screen i pretty much you know design and animate for it so yeah try not to wow. keep myself in the box just you know stay as versatile as possible I know starting off, I just kind of want to go over a little bit into your experience because like you said, been going on since 2006, just an incredible history uh, of work experience there. Um, what are just some of maybe like the big clients and big projects you've been working on or have worked on in the past? Yeah, so I would say the biggest is probably my very first one. I got to work on um fantastic four rise of the silver surfer that was like my very first project that i professionally got to work on which was crazy because wow. i kind of lied my way into it because i was <laughs> i was interning at the time for adam sandler of all people like it, it that's a whole story in itself but an opportunity appeared and they're like hey we're working on this marvel film you know where he's just cinema 4d do you know cinema because you know we'd love to have you on we see how ambitious you are and I had never used cinema in my life, but I lied my way into it and said, of course I know cinema because I was using 3D Max back then and just stayed at the studio, reading a thick manual every single night trying to figure out cinema because we didn't have YouTube the way it is today back then. Like everything was just thick manuals and yeah, just kind of bullied my way through it. And from there, yeah, the rest was history. So that's probably my favorite project because I grew up a comic book nerd. And then too, you know, that was that that proved to myself that i can make anything happen as long as you put your mind to it and you know more films came after that got to work on iron man and transformers and i guess another one of my favorite would be my little pony because my daughter was a big fan at the time and i was working out of my home office during that time and she would art direct me from behind my shoulders so that was a big <laughs> that was a pretty cool one too in itself but yeah been definitely blessed over the past couple of years to work on projects like that Wow. That's amazing. So resident art director uh, in-house. I love it. Yeah, it actually helped me with the job because I was on a call at Hasbro and I think they were kind of leery. Like, you know, I didn't maybe know about the universe there. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, Twilight Sparkle and Applejack and Equestria <laughs> World. And they're just like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> like, you know about this stuff? I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like my daughter's a big fan. So I know it through her and I knew about the entire universe. So it's just one of those perfect alignments there. Yeah, oh, that's man. amazing. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, like right out the gate, having such a, a an amazing first job opportunity working on uh, Rise of Silver Surfer. So just in general, like aside from obviously the technical stuff, with, which you mentioned, like not knowing cinema, what is it like to sort of go from 
just, you know, you, well, you were interning for Adam Sandler, which I would love to hear more about, but like, you know, (laughs) operating and going to, to working on a scale or a production that large, like aside from the technical stuff, were there certain things that surprised you about the process working on such a, a large scale production? Yeah, because um, at the time, I want to say there was two other artists that were working there. There was the art director lead and then another artist that had maybe like another year or two experience working in the industry at that point. So I was the third artist that was brought on board. And, um, you know, they knew the workflows working between cinema and After Effects. I only knew After Effects at that time because I mm-hmm. went to art school and in art school, they taught us Maya, 3D Max, and After Effects. So, like, I had absolutely no idea how to use cinema. And I kind of was, you know, I was learning it on my own on the side there. Like I said, I would stay at the studio late at night because I didn't have my own license. And during the daytime, I would just ask them a lot of questions just like, hey, how do you do X, Y, and Z? And just kind of work your way through it. I think after maybe a week or two, they kind of realized like, yeah, this guy doesn't know cinema. But I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was there till like 2, 3 a.m., every single night trying to get it done so i think my work ethic kind of made up for it nice wow. that's awesome that's great yeah just sitting at the studio like i love cinema 5d uh... <laughs> yeah pretty much because <laughs> i'm asking like what what's 4d like where's the extra dimension that in they're like no that's just the name i'm thinking like 3d to 4d i'm thinking it's like actual functionality and yeah mm-hmm. right <laughs> Today's sponsor is 123RF. They have everything on their site with millions of royalty-free stock images and vectors. As well, they have amazing videos that you can use to enhance any of your projects. And these clips go all the way up to 4K. They also have tons of audio and unique fonts to choose from. But one of my favorite things that they offer is their AI image generator. You can type in any prompt you want and then choose a style to go with it. It's super easy to use and the best part is, is you actually get a license for it. So you can use it in anything you want. Kind of a game changer. That being said, thank you again to our sponsors, 123RF and back to the episode. You know, not to go off topic, but I mean, how did, how do you even wind up working with Adam Sandler? That, that is crazy. That was one of those things where like people said I was lucky, but I kind of put myself in a position to get lucky, you know, because like I I originally went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. That's where I'm originally from. Got my bachelor's degree in um, motion graphics and VFX. And then at that point, you're basically burning your demo reel onto portable DVDs. I don't know if people remember that. Like you (laughs) you get like a DVD burner, you get like a big bundle, like 50 or 100 pack and (laughs) you just burn it physically on these discs. And there was a book at Barnes and Noble that had the addresses for all the studios in Hollywood, New York. Mm. So I literally went through and mailed out a copy of my demo reel to every single studio on the West wow. Coast that was in that book. So I went through a couple of bundles there and um, it just so happened that at the time, Adam Sandler's assistant, his personal assistant was from Pittsburgh. And so she saw the Pittsburgh address on the envelope and that kind of piqued her interest, I guess, because she opened it up and saw my work and she just called me out of the blue, say like, hey, you know, me and Adam watched the work. We, um, you know, if you're ever in town, we'd love to talk to you. And I'm just like, I could be there tomorrow. And they're like, no, no, no. You know, just if you're ever in town, because, you know, I'm from Pittsburgh and I know how far that is, but I didn't want to leave anything to chance. So I caught a red eye flight, spent like every single dollar I had left in my bank account showed up at the doorstep the next day and yeah the rest was history from there once i showed up at the doorstep they're just like holy crap like this guy <laughs> literally flew overnight to come meet us so they gave me a short interview and offered me an internship on the spot wow that is amazing that is amazing it, I, I love that i love that because honestly i once had an opportunity one of my very first opportunities here was to work at a like a vfx house in new york and I was like, I'm going to go visit. I'm going to go straight. I'm buying a plane <laughs> ticket right now. And uh, my parents were like, tell them you live in North Carolina. And I was like, <laughs> I, I, I was like, I'm not doing that. And they're like, do it. Come on. They're like, you might just get up there. It might be a waste of money. And then I, of course, I wind up saying I'm in North Carolina. And they go, ah, you know what? We don't want you traveling all the way out here. Like, nah, right. we're okay. And I was like, damn, I should have just gotten the ticket and flew right over there. But. Anyway, funny yeah. story. So, so I lo- oh, go ahead, Mikey. 
Oh, well, I was going to say, so we, we had like kind of the Silver Surfer moment and then you kind of progressed on to doing some more Marvel films. How was that kind of going into those fields? Was that something that you then pursued kind of full time or were you doing freelance client? Like what were those projects like? Were those year long or just kind of getting segments? Yeah, honestly, I mean, that's the thing I liked about, especially back then, working on these projects, because they would only last, like, usually motion graphics seemed like they were, like, the last ones to get on a project for whatever reason, especially for, like, the title sequences and stuff. Mm. So you only had, like, a couple of weeks to bang it out before the deadline. So it's pretty much, like, in and out, especially Silver Surfer, I want to say that was maybe, like, three weeks. And then for wow. Iron Man, I got to work on the marketing campaign. So got to design the logo for it and do the announcement trailer and all the TV spots and magazine ads and stuff, which was really cool. But wow, it was a thing of I was still working under Adam because like mm. Adam, he's he's a really smart guy, like business wise, like he had all these studios set up for Hollywood that would allow him to make movies at like a really small budget. So he had like a motion graphics house. He had a um oh, he had wow. a editorial suite and then he also had an um he had a print house and so it's mm. like you know he would make a movie he had his directors that he would like to use he would send the edits off to the editorial house and then if there's any vfx or motion graphics he would send it to our department and then any type of print or billboards it's like he had wow. everything covered but the way he had it set up they were all separate entities outside of happy madison and so we were able to take on other projects from other clients and that was the loophole there so we were doing stuff with marvel we were doing stuff with um mtv and so on top of doing adam sandler stuff at happy madison we were also able to bring in all these other clients as well which was really cool so it's like i'm working full time wow. there but i'm also getting all this experience working with all these other clients as well so it's one of those um one of those unicorn moments, right? Cause I don't know if anything like that is ever going to happen again, but yeah. Well, definitely great I do want to ask, it. It, it makes me think like just hearing that, hearing you describe that and especially that being such an early experience for you, which I would imagine is like pretty transformative, just like that having that perspective, I kind of feel like maybe that's not the exact model that you have going on. Right. But like, you're an incredible artist, you're working on incredible projects. You also have done such an amazing job of you know, building this community and educating, you know, helping educate the next generation of artists. Do you find yourself applying some of those methodologies or those things you learned early on in your career to sort of how you're managing your day to day now? Yeah, absolutely. Because I was able to observe a lot what was going on, even, you know, if it wasn't intentional for them to see or for me to see what they were doing, like just having multiple streams of revenue, I thought was really cool. You know, he had each mm. one of his departments there and they were all generating revenue even if he wasn't working on a film they were still bringing in you know revenue from e entertainment or mtv or sony so i thought that was really cool and then um also it was all about a collaborative effort like this was i guess like when i was interning they told me they didn't want me to go out for coffee and you know just do all like the grunt work he told me that we want to have you here so that you can learn our workflows and learn how we work so that you can become a valuable studio or, or a valuable artist to our studio. So it's almost like we're bringing you in as a paid intern, we're training you so that then you could go on to work for us. We don't just want you to go get donuts for six months and then go off somewhere else. And so I always thought that that was really important because while I was there, I was learning from all the different artists there there was um a lot of them went on to be my mentor and a lot of them went on to do great stuff. So it's like, not only am I working under Adam, I'm also working under all these great artists and they're teaching me as I'm, you know, starting to come to my own being an artist there. So I always thought that was important and just trying to pay that forward because I always felt fortunate in my position. And I know a lot of people aren't going to get that opportunity. So the least I could do is at least put out what I know and what I'm learning to other people. And you just never know who's going to learn from it. Mm, I love that. I love that. And as well, one of my first jobs I got was because of an internship. So some people, yeah. they kind of don't think the idea of internship is worth it. But right. I personally find if it paid off and for you, that's just an incredible experience that seems like I love that they were able to provide that stepping ladder. So I love where you got started and just, you know, some of those beginning steps you had. Um, but coming up to the modern day future, 
Uh, you use Unreal Engine a lot, which I am so excited about. And I'm excited to hear some of your work with it. But how are you using Unreal Engine with some of your client work today? Yeah, so that was one of those things that kind of happened by accident, right? So this was, I've been using Unreal since version 4.5, I want to say. So this was like wow. 2019. I was at SIGGRAPH. It was here up in LA. So I was there on the show floor and Epic had like a huge booth there. And they just announced that they had the um, this thing called the Datasmith plugin that will allow you to take native Cinema 4D project files into Unreal. And this was brand new just on that day. So I was excited because I'm like, okay, I'm a C40 wizard. I've always wanted to learn, you know, Unreal. Like I knew a little bit of Unity back in, from my VR days, but Unreal, I really saw the potential there. So I went home, looked it up. There was absolutely like no documentation on it at all. There was just that blurb on the um, up on the Epic Games website just saying like, now you can import Cinema 4D projects in there. So I stayed up all night trying to figure it out. Finally figured out the workflow, put out a tutorial for it, went back to SIGGRAPH the next day. And um, Paul Babb, who is one of the top guys at Max on there, pulled me aside and he's like, hey, are you that Wimbush guy? And I'm like, yeah. And he's <laughs> like, yeah, your tutorial has been going around the office. Like, we didn't even know this was a possible thing and nobody hit us up about it. And you already had this figured out. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I was just excited about it. And so that kind of kicked off my relationship with Max on there. Then some of the people at Epic pulled me aside there on the show floor, like, hey, we saw that tutorial that you did. So it's kind of crazy how like one tutorial kind of spread into like what I'm doing today, because it was a lot of questions coming from people in the community. And with those questions, I would go figure it out and just keep putting out more and more tutorials and content. And yeah, it's just one of those things that kind of had a life of its own. And to the point to where I was finally like, I got to kind of put my... I guess the, put your money where your mouth is, right? And so I started using it on actual client projects. Like I used it last year on a TV show I worked on with History Channel and the people over there, they loved it. Like they were like, man, you're working fast. Like we're giving you notes and you're turning it around really quickly. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm using this thing called Unreal. And that was probably a mistake because now they just expect me to turn things around really <laughs> fast. But yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things when you get excited, you just want to tell everything or tell everybody about, right? So mm -hmm. it's just one of those things that kind of took on a life of its own. And yeah, I'm using it even today on a lot of client work. Wow. Well, I love the idea of just not telling and being like, no, I'm not using Unreal Engine. This takes a day or two yeah. to render still. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was my mistake. I shouldn't have, well, it's going to eventually come out, right? Because I'm on YouTube now, so they would eventually yeah, see yeah. it. But yeah, at the time, I, I probably should have kept my mouth shut and just sat on it for a day or two mm. and then turn yeah. it in. But yeah. So, um, and this is kind of a bit of an aside. Uh, we, I'll figure out a way to kind of formalize this question if the answer that I think it, it is kind of lines up. But before yeah. I get there, um, are you, did you receive an Epic uh, grant? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is kind of just some, I, one, I, I'm just going to like profess a little bit of like, thank you so much for everything you do, because I learned Unreal <laughs> basically with your Unreal in five days. Like, oh, I think you, being man. in a, I think <laughs> being in a, um, like being in any sort of, uh, you know, 3D creation suite now, like you, it starts to apply like pretty easily. Like if you're coming, I'm a blender guy, but if you're coming from cinema or you're coming from another thing, I think you did an amazing job of just like translating those things really well. But, oh, um, you. but I, I recently also saw like Ash Thorpe who's picking up Unreal. um, he, you know, mentioned in like a story the other day, he's like, I'm going to apply for an Epic grant to make some short films in Unreal. So yeah, I did want to kind of try to get a question. <laughs> What's that? No, I said I actually yelled at him yesterday. I texted him. I was like, dude, why didn't you tell me you're applying? You could have used me as a reference. Oh, like, oh, true, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't want to bother you. I'm just like, come on, man. Just so <laughs> so I do want to ask, um, I guess the question being, can you just share a little bit about what the Epic Grant program is and maybe how it's benefited you and like what the application process looks like? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So when I applied for it, I actually had a training course out already through this website called mograph.com. And so this was for Unreal Engine 4. And the one of the things that really kind of hurt was it was like 250 bucks, right? Which, you know, to us probably isn't a lot of money, but to a lot of a lot of people around the world, like they were saying like, that's like a month's worth of income for them. And 
they wanted to take the training course, but they couldn't afford it. So that's when mm-hmm. I went to Epic and just said like, hey, I would love to put together a program, maybe apply for the grant. They were 100% behind it. And that's where the mega grant came in. So they actually funded me to create that Unreal Engine 5 in five days so that I could put it out on YouTube so that anybody would be able to come in and learn Unreal if they wanted to. And, you know, it's on YouTube, so it's all self-paced and like you said, you're a Blender user. Like I tried to make it as agnostic as possible. So no matter what your 3D background was, you'd be able to come in and learn Unreal and be able to apply it to your skill set. But yeah, that was basically just me trying to give back as much as I can to the people that really couldn't afford to take a paid training course. At least now they have some type of beginning that they could jump in and learn something and, you know, get the ball rolling. Absolutely. And like, just at a broader, at a like broader picture, what, so do, are, I mean, you might not have the answer to this, but like how much money does Epic give in grants per year for this kind of work? Or really, I mean, I know it's a, it varies yeah. in projects. Some might be educational, some might be, you know, pushing the technical limitations of the program. But right. I mean, it's one of those things that um, truthfully, I just haven't done enough of the research myself, but having gone through the process, if you're familiar with any of that, I mean, I'd love to to hear. Yeah, I know individual projects, they don't give them the numbers out on that. Um, I can't remember. Uh, like there was like a big pool of money. I want to say like 500 million. That's probably more than what it is. But yeah, they have like a big sum of money allocated for the mega grant program, somewhere like that. And they give out, you know, a certain percentage of it for a year because it's been out for a couple of years now. But when it first started, it was more about people that were really trying to bring Umbro engine into the workflow. So like Adidas got one. I think Nike got a mega grant. Um, Maxon got one so they could blend cinema better with Unreal Engine. Um, Blender actually got a mega grant. So they were focusing on bringing other entities into the Unreal workflow. And then year two, it was where they were doing more of the educational people. So I know I got one. Um, Matt Workman, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He got one. He does a lot of virtual production stuff and a couple of other YouTube channels. But then um, also, if you have like a video game, they're funding a lot of indie developers and stuff as well during that time. But most recently, um, because I was going to apply for another one, and I was actually talking to some of the people over there, and they're really all about the um, Unreal Engine for Fortnite stuff right now. If you want to get a mega grant, I would say definitely look into the Fortnite stuff because that's where a lot of their funds are being allocated right now because they're going all in on Fortnite. Like I even know Tim Sweeney said at um, GDC earlier this year, like Fortnite is their blueprint for the Epic um, Metaverse, the Epic Games Metaverse that they're creating. So I know they're like 99% allocating a lot of funds over to that. So It's a beautiful game when it comes to cross platforms. It's one of the first massive ones. And it's just that in itself, it almost feels like a metaverse. The fact that somebody can be on their cell phone and somebody can be on their Xbox or PC and have a seamless gaming experience together. It's really crazy. If you can just elaborate on what you think about the Fortnite creator and then as well, some of the other cool new features on Unreal and what you're most excited about. Yeah, so when you first take a look at it, like it looks just like Unreal Engine 5, right? And so I mm-hmm. dove into it thinking I was just going to knock right through it. Like, oh, I know Unreal 5, like the back of my hand. And it it's absolutely not that. Like it has the foundations of Unreal 5, but it's totally its own thing. Like it has its own programming language called Versus. Um you have to really think like a game developer, like the one of the caveats is your texture is going to be 2K textures at the most because you have to mm. think Fortnite is an always living entity up there on the cloud and it's always streaming to a device. Like, yeah, you download it to your system, but it's streaming to all these platforms. And so you can't just throw the kitchen sink at it like you can Unreal Engine 5. It's like you have to be a little bit more practical in which you apply to it and you know, just a little bit more resourceful. So it's definitely been, uh, um, it's been a learning experience, but it's been fun because I always wanted to be a game developer, even way back in the day, making my own games and stuff. So it's just one of those things. It's, it's an easier approach into creating your own game levels there. And like, there's kids out there, there's like teenagers out there right now, making a lot of money, just, you know, making their own maps, throwing it up there on Fortnite and they're crushing it right now. So it's easy enough to where anybody could jump into it, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's cool to just see again, not only, you know, I think we've all figured out like, oh, 3D 
and gaming would kind of eventually collide. And we're kind of seeing that happen for the first time where it sounds like you had a massive 3D career. And just like that, you're able to kind of use those talents in video games pretty easily because it's Unreal Engine, which I completely love. Um, it's so cool. Uh, Unreal Engine 5 is just amazing. Uh, w what other cool features have you used with Unreal Engine 5? Is there anything else that gets you excited, whether it be with the metaverse or just future technology on like Lumen or something of that nature? Yeah, so I put up um, before I had went out on the, the last tour, I just put out a tutorial on some of the stuff with 5.3 because that's currently in preview mm. right now. And the biggest right. feature was the VDBs, at least for me, because now we can natively bring in VDBs into Unreal Engine 5 and they're playing back in real time. So that was always a problem in the past. You weren't able to import them. You had to do these weird workarounds with this thing called flipbooks, which are basically just like an image sequence. And so it wasn't quite volumetric, but now they have figured out how you could bring it in. It automatically converts it and it, it plays back really good. Like it's not perfect yet, but it's still in beta. But that's probably one of the biggest um, things that I was excited about because that's a feature myself and a couple of other artists have been asking for for the past couple of years. And then also um, updates and path tracing because they actually hired the um, the co-author of the Arnold render. I don't know if you guys are familiar with mm -hmm. Arnold. But yeah, one of the guys that co-created that now is working for Epic Games and he's been hitting up the Path Tracer on there, which that's looking really good. So you're getting like Arnold, Redshift, Octane, um, Cycles type quality now out of Unreal or yeah, out of Unreal Engine 5, which is shaping up really nicely. So for me, those two are the biggest updates right now that I'm most excited about. So he said a feature that you've been wanting that they just gave you. What other features are you hoping they implement into the software? As a cinema user, Maxon has been working on their side to implement a lot of stuff. Like they just came out with an update where you could take a full native Cinema 4D project with like dynamic simulation, redshift cameras, redshift lights, and redshift materials. And it all just comes over to Unreal now. You don't have to do any hacks or anything, which that's been great for me because I still like using cinema. Um, but on the Epic side, I'm trying to think like the MetaHuman stuff could always be a little bit easier to use. I mean, mm -hmm. that I, I steer away from the MetaHuman stuff just because it is like pretty tedious even today. So I think if they could kind of make that a little bit easier to use, that would be a big plus there. But yeah, it's one of those things you don't know what you want till you get it. <laughs> you know, it's like mm -hmm. they throw it in there and you're like, oh, yeah, that's what we needed. So, <laughs> yeah. Or you don't know what you want until you're on a project and the, the clock is ticking. Yeah, it you comes come across, <laughs> You come across that one thing where you're like, oh, man, how have I not noticed that I need this one feature? Yeah. You know what? After Effects support. Like, it'd be cool Ooh. to be able to export out, like, like you an know, EXR sequence and cameras. Yeah, cameras, all that stuff. Because I, I figured out a hack, but it's not. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, just like, just like camera data and, and object yeah. data, yeah. I feel like, I don't know if you've had experience, but I know with the Apple Vision Pro coming out, there's been a massive push for USDs, and yeah. um, I would love to see some, I don't know how After Effects would be able to implement that, but I would love if somehow this cross communication between software the metaverse of file formats <laughs> i mean they got that like that avengers type thing going on right now with usd right i forget is it called like the allegiance of usd something oh it's some like superhero type name but yeah i saw like adobe's on there um epic games blender um i think side effects like a lot of these massive companies are like yeah we need this universal file format, which is, I think it's long overdue just because these pipelines are being used so much. We have all these different artists from all these different disciplines. And a lot of time it's hard to like cross pollinate with a lot of these programs. So it's long overdue, you know, it's finally here. Well, at least hopefully it's finally here, you know. I, I hope so, man, because it, it's just so cool that, you know, if you're working with somebody in Max and you're, you know, maybe you're doing something in ZBrush or, even to substance, if it was just a seamless workflow. I want to ask too, uh, this is a little, but before we move on to any subjects, just kind of like the, speaking of metaverse a little bit, what's your experience with, because we don't get a lot of people that 
kind of are in this realm, but what is your experience with um, VR and Unreal? So I've been doing VR since 2016. I got into it around the Oculus DK2. So actually I'm down here in Irvine and Oculus was right in my backyard here until they got bought out by um, Facebook there. But I've been in it for a minute. So like I said, I was using Unity back in the day for VR. I didn't really do, I guess you would say like the room scale stuff. Like I, I seem to move more into like the 360 VR space because I was doing music videos and things of that experience that I thought was really cool. But like VR with Unreal right now, I think is in a good place. Like you could actually bring in Nanite models, which they just updated that in 5.2. So you can have like these really big luscious terrains and you're not getting any type of lag in there. Like I'm able to work at 60 Hertz and I feel like having these photorealistic worlds is really what's going to transport people into VR. I think that was a big element that was missing. Like a lot of it looked like Nintendo Wii characters, you know, like if you look at the Facebook metaverse, it's just like, are we going back to that era of characters? It's just like, it's not really immersive. Like I think when people put on yeah. a VR headset, they want like ready player one. Like that's what, before they get into it, that's what's in their head. So the more realistic and immersive you can make it, I think the better you are on the end user getting the stay inside of your experience. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you on that. I, I, I kind of felt like the Quest and the Oculus in a weird way because of the hardware, it made the industry go backwards. And so yep. it kind of almost in a weird way was a roadblock. But at the same time, it allowed for so many more users and so much more funding. So it was kind of, uh, it was just interesting how it was like both a benefit and kind of a step back. So, I mean, I liked the Quest. Um, the, the thing I did like was how you could hook it up to a PC to get mm -hmm. a more immersive experience because you had that extra hardware there. But it's one of those things, if you only used a mobile, like a lot of um, hobbyists would use it, then you're like limited to the mobile tech in which, you know, your frame rates are going to go down, the fidelity of the graphics are going to go down, and you're basically stuck to like Beat Saber and Rec Room type experiences, right? So it's like, yep. it's a cool gimmick to have, but you really need some some power behind it if you want to make something really dope. I can't even imagine with Nanite and just getting the, you know, Unreal Engine 5 at full potential in VR and just seeing some new applications with that would be absolutely incredible. When I saw the um, the Matrix demo scene in uh, mm. in Unreal yeah. Five, what, that's when I was like, dude, if we can, once this is real time in a headset, you know, there's no question that like sign me up. You know, I that is <laughs> it, that, I've been wanting that since I was you know nine years old. Like when you first <laughs> think about that's the other thing that's kind of crazy with VR is it's sort of, it's been in the the sort of uh, the group thing for such a long time, you know, like science right. fiction has talked about VR. There were like the old school Nintendo had like an old school headset at one point, you know, it's always been something that's yeah. like in the background and we just haven't kind of crossed that threshold. But when I see demo, like when I see what unreal is capable of doing now and, you know, being able to extend that into a VR universe, I'm like, right. you get way more adoption, you get way more, you know, you can actually have really meaningful stories and immersive experiences. Did you guys see the Unreal GDC talk this year where they had the car going through that like jungle terrain type thing? And oh, it was like, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, the with the uh, yeah, the Rivian, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So yeah. somebody got because that's all built with nanite. And what's the new material system? It's like uh, the sub substrate, so they got all that stuff working at 60 hertz inside of VR. Like I have to try to find it. It was on YouTube, but they were able to convert that because, you know, Epic always gives the project files out for people to experiment with. And so that's the first thing someone did was they're like, I want to walk around this terrain in VR and they made it work. And the playback was, it, I mean, it was running in real time at 60 Hertz, which I thought was pretty crazy. So it's like, it's there, it's able to mm -hmm. happen. It's just going to be up to the developers to really, you know, implement it and make something crazy now. I wonder what the specs were. Just need five 4090s. I <laughs> want to say he had a 4090. I'll try to find a video clip to send it to you guys, but I think it was just off of 14090. I mean, I wow. say only 14090, but yeah. yeah you know, still... like... <laughs> and if I recall correctly, I feel like the latter part of that presentation, a lot of it was emphasizing the procedural slash AI slash machine learning driven world building tools that are coming out with unreal and of course it's like you can't have a conversation about all this crazy amazing new tech in this industry without also sort of talking about the elephant in the room which is ai 
and all of the things that kind of come along with that. Just kind of curious what your experience has been so far with AI. Are there tools that you're using and are there things you're excited about and kind of your your general perspective on AI? I've kind of learned to sit back and just observe because I was driving myself crazy trying to keep up with everything. The AI tools are moving at such a pace that I, I've never experienced it before. You know, like when we had updates to programs, sometimes it was like every 12 months. More recently, it's been every six months. But with this AI stuff, is like every hour. The things that I've been playing around with the most are using AI for photogrammetry. Like I was mm. just recently doing some stuff earlier with this um this company I discovered out of Seoul, Korea. They're called 3D Presso. You can use any camera, any phone or anything. You can scan like your toys. Like they can have reflective surfaces. And once you upload it to the website, just like a two minute clip of circling around it, even with reflection and everything, like the AI is working to bring it all together. And then you have an FBX file at the end of the day that you could just bring into, you know, Blender, Cinema, Unreal. And that's the type of stuff that I'm excited about because, you know, I've worked with a lot of music artists and athletes there in the past. And it would have been cool to be able to test, you know, just while you're on set, maybe scan some of the memorabilia or some of the stuff that you're using. And then you have a 3D model of that particular asset. And so I'm like, now, you know, if I'm doing something with somebody, it's just like whip out the phone, scan around the area. And now I have a 3D representation of whatever it was that I needed, which I think is really dope. Is that you know? 3D Presso app? So uh, you're saying like just through the ca your built-in phone camera app, it's not even a specific uh, application that you have to download from them or like follow us. You know, I've done the yeah. photogrammetry where it's like 600 shots that you got to take from, yeah. this is just a video <laughs> file that you're uploading. Yeah, this is just a video file. They, um, you know, just like 4K, 30 frames per second. Um, I think it was like two minute maximum. But the thing I liked about them, because I was using Luma AI before, like I was, I had mm -hmm. a vacation in Hawaii and I was just scanning everything just so I could recreate Hawaii and unreal but <laughs> with this one you can actually use a turntable which none of the other applications you could really use a turntable mm. with and so i literally just put my my phone up on a tripod just had the turntable going around lower it a little bit let it you know do another revolution and yeah i mean it is as simple as that so this technology is getting really crazy and it's getting pretty good I also saw um, EJ recently did, uh, I think it was, I can't remember what talk he, he did it for, but Move AI, which was another one that uh, I yeah. flagged mm -hmm. kind of earlier on, yep. which was like, I joke, I mean, I'm actually using an old iPhone now as my webcam. I joke with Mikey all the time. It's like, I have all these old iPhones laying around, right? And it's like, my, my fiance is like, why do you have these? We need to get rid of them. Like, at what point in your life are you going to yeah. need an iPhone 10? Right? <laughs> Move AI comes out and it's like, if you have all your old iPhones, you know, set up three iPhones and you can do motion capture. And I saw EJ did that with, um, you know, the one character he's designed and he did show the oh, reference yeah, video and pug. showed like the actual Move AI capture. And that I agree. I mean, that kind of. And, and, you know, truthfully, if we're being honest, Rotobrush is AI driven. So technically, if you're, you know, yeah. if you're an After Effects user yeah. and you've used Rotobrush, I mean, that's, that's an AI or machine learning driven tool. So it's like, I think there is the hype around, you know, or the doomsday around uh, like AI being, you know, AGI or general intelligence and all that. But it's like, truthfully, there are so many useful tools that you might not even realize you're already using. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I agree. I think the photogrammetry stuff is, it would be huge to be able to just on set or, you know, you're doing a product video and say they have a test product, like a shoe or something. They send you, you yeah. know, I did a shoe render once where I had the actual sh physical shoe in my office, but I'm still doing like box modeling on it from reference photos. And I'm like, if I could just scan that, that would be, you know, a huge game changer. So absolutely. I did a show a couple of years ago. Um, I can't remember. It was for a history channel. I can't remember the name of the ship, but it's, it's like a Titanic situation, right? Like there's this big lavish ship. It sunk, of course, and it's at the bottom of the ocean. And what they did was they had like a, a real sculpture come out and make like a miniature sculpt of it. Like, I mean, I say miniature, but it was huge. And they wanted me to replicate it so we could do the CG renders and stuff. And so I had to take a ton of photos and same thing, I hired like a ZBrush modeler. I'm like, this thing was so detailed. I just sent him over auto reference photos and it took him probably about two weeks to be able to model it out. Like it was really good, but you know, that was two weeks that we could have been in production doing other stuff. And so it's like, if it was a project today, I could have actually took those photos, you know, throw them into a photogrammetry program and have an actual replica of that model that was built to scale, which that would have saved a ton of time. And plus you're getting exactly with the production studio had already created in real life. So 
Yeah, those those little situations there mean a lot. Another caveat people are saying is like, well, you're taking a job away from that ZBrush guy, but it's a tough one because that's that's kind of the thing with evolution, right? You're going to have those hiccups as you're going along, but he might be able to come in in a different regard. So yeah, it, it's just one of those things we're just going to have to figure out and just kind of evolve. And, and of course, it's like there's such a sensitivity around, obviously, you don't want anyone to lose a job, right? Especially, right. I think, in the last couple of years, it's been, in in general, this industry, I think, has had a, a bit of a moment of, you know, people, a lot of, with COVID, I mean, it was industry, not just our industry, it's, you know, worldwide. It's like, there's been such a, a massive change in sort of the, the work-life balance of people and how people are working. So there's that sensitivity there too. You still have to go back and do remeshing and, you know, it's yeah. not always perfect. There's still, mm -hmm. there's still so many hands that have to be involved in the process. I think not shying away from the tools and just like trying to pick them up and trying to learn them and, and see if it's something that works for you or not, or something that inspires you. It's, it, that's never a bad thing. I also feel that, of course, you're going to get a perfect model and they're going to say something along the lines of, oh, can you add like a mermaid sculpture onto the front of the boat? Yeah. And <laughs> boom, now you now you wish yep. you learned ZBrush, you know, and funny, I will say I've been using Mid Journey a lot recently in order to get photo references and. I've noticed that with five and kind of as you get kind of more complex that it's not as I don't want to say creative, but it doesn't do off like characteristic things. So if you say I want a person with six eyeballs, I think they've been training them with like anti prompts to be like, no, don't do that because everyone wants a human with two eyeballs. So right. why waste it? And it's impossible. I'm telling you, anybody try it right now on 5.2, <laughs> try typing in a face with two noses or six eyeballs and it can't do it. I notice with the better mid journey gets, the more I can't do these abstract pieces. And so in a weird way, it was like a glimmer of hope. <laughs> right. But um, yeah. yeah, it was just uh, it's interesting that maybe you have to like start training your models. But like you said, it's something where that's going to just take so much time to learn. And by the time you learn it. It's already a different way of doing it. So at the end of the day, I still think you have to be good at your craft to be able to even use it to begin with. Like I've had producers recently try to use it to like offset like the storyboard process. And it's just like they're trying their hardest to get what they want implemented there. And it's kind of like, well, this is why you have storyboard artists because you describe what you want to them and then they're able to create that for you. And they're coming across with your vision rather than you bang your head against all these prompts and you know, you're saying like, I want a six eyed alien and it's not giving it to you. And you keep typing it a hundred different ways when you could have just asked somebody just like, Hey, can you design this six eyed alien? And it's like, boom, there they go. So if, I think you're still going to need professionals at the end of the day. I think the people that are trying to truly just rely on AI, I feel like they're going to kind of be bottom at the barrel at some point, because you're going to always need specialists because they're going to know what to look out for, even when it comes to like lighting, compositing, things of that nature. Like if you don't have a good eye for design, you're just going to throw any type of garbage out there. And then once people see it, you know, to an untrained eye, something that's always kind of seems off, right? Like the uncanny valley. So yeah, you're, I, I don't think people are going to be losing as much as they think they are. Well, I want to move on a little bit to uh, something. I mean, we touched on it a little bit, but something I'm excited to talk about um, just your journey with doing tutorials, man. I mean, I remember that funny enough, the data Smith was one of the first tutorials I ever watched by. And I think that was the introduction tutorial, um, right. for me into some of your artwork, but how is that journey of doing tutorials? What's kind of your process on making these things? Like even before the unreal stuff, like I was dabbling in tutorials just because I've been working remote for myself for about 10 years now. So a lot of the projects that I do, like 90% of the time, it's like all me handling it from start to finish. And so there comes those times where you might hit roadblocks, like, you know, with the 3D program or After Effects or whatever, and you're just trying to figure it out. And then once you figure it out, maybe six months down the road, another totally different project comes and you hit that same roadblock and you're like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. But then you forget the steps that you took to get there. And so... <laughs> I would always like after that happens so many times, I'm like, I'm just going to start recording when I have Roblox <laughs> just for myself and have my own personal archive. 
And so yeah. whenever those roadblocks would come again, I could just go back and watch my screen recordings. And this is like back with AOL Instant Messenger was still a thing. You know, I had like my list of artist friends that I've made from out the years and people would DM me like, hey, Wimbush, do you happen to know how to do X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, oh yeah, let me pull up that video clip and send it to you because I figured that out like three months ago. And then a lot of people, I guess they were just getting tired of asking. They're like, why didn't you just put this stuff on YouTube? And I'm like, <laughs> I <laughs> like it never it never crossed my mind. I'm like, I just did it for me just because like I got tired I of that. refiguring Damn, stuff I, out. And stuff. I gotta say, like that is the most unexpected answer that I thought I would get. Because, <laughs> well, no, I mean it's just like you know nowadays we are in this this world that's like so driven by content, and I do think that a lot of people that get into motion design or VR or AR 3D or any of that. Sharing your work is really, I would say, in a lot of instances now a requirement. It's not really an option anymore. Like if you're not right. if you're not constantly sharing your process or, you know, the the tips for having a great portfolio is like show your behind the scenes, show your yeah. workflow, show all, leading up to the final product. But it's so funny to hear you say that because I think all of us can, I mean, I certainly can relate to you hit those road roadblocks and it's the worst when you know you've solved the problem on a project yeah. like three or four months ago, but you're yep. like, shit, I didn't, I didn't write it down. I didn't screen cap it. So it's, you know, I think that's, that might be the pro tip of the whole episode here is like when you start hitting a roadblock, start at the very least screen cap. And I also have to ask, how are you cataloging it? Would you just like rename the clip, you know, doing X in this program or something? Yeah, like I just have my folder, you know, like I have a C4D folder, After Effects folder, um, Rowflow folder, and then you just name your clips on basically what you did. Then I would name the project because the Roblox always came with the project, right? So whether if it's like My Little Pony or something like figuring out how to do something in After Effects, you just kind of name it out in there and, you know, you just always have reference for it. This was years ago that I was doing that. And so like YouTube never crossed my mind. And even back then, a lot of artists were kind of keeping their, their tips and tricks to their chest because that's how they would get hired out for studio work and stuff like that. So a lot of artists back then, they weren't sharing as much as people are sharing now. Like you go on YouTube and everybody's just sharing everything. Back then, it's like if you are known for a technique, they would actually hold that to their chest because oh, Prologue's going to hire me because I know how to do this and nobody else knows how to do it. So it wasn't a lot of sharing back then, which mm. I always thought kind of sucked. Like if people asked me, like I said, I would just give them the clip and say like, yeah, this is how you do it. Because I feel like that's how you learn. Because if people saw my clip and they saw how I do it, and then maybe they'll come to me. It's like, hey, I went through your tip. And if you skip this and do this, you can actually do it faster. So there was a lot of back and forth doing that as well, which Back when I used to work at studios, we would always just, you know, riff off each other and do that type of stuff. So, right. yeah, I always mm. was always for giving because you would always learn and reciprocate back. I can't remember who I, I want to say there's like an Einstein quote or something, but it's basically this idea that like if you can't explain something in three steps, you probably don't understand it well enough, you know? And so by going through, the, <laughs> by going through the, I mean, obviously right. certain things are going to be way more complicated than three steps, but I guess the right. sentiment being, you know, by by going through the practice of teaching or just really organizing your thoughts of what you've just done and what you've just created and putting it into, you know, for example, the, the tutorials that you're publishing today on YouTube, I'm sure that just reinforces the knowledge for you that much more. I also want to ask a little bit about like community feedback and getting questions from people, how yeah. much that motivates or inspires you to create further content or, you know, dive into a certain part of a program that you might not otherwise. That's always been a tough one just because like when I first started it, like I used to do Redshift, Cinema 40 and X Particles tutorials. Like that was my bread and butter back then. You know, I'd only have maybe a couple hundred people following me. So whenever people would ask questions, I would jump right on it, you know, make a tutorial and reply that way. But as I started growing my channel more and more, it's become harder to the point to where it's like, even though I want to answer everybody, it, it's just tough just because, you know, there's not enough hours in a day. And plus the questions have been getting more complicated too, to the point to where it feels like people want me to figure out their whole client project for me, you know, so <laughs> it's just one of those like, things. Well, my, like... my art, my technical direction rate is uh, yeah. $10,000 a day. Yeah. So that that's the tough part. Like they're getting more complicated and, you know, I try to help as much as I can, but there's only so much you could do. Right. But mm -hmm. there's always, um, 
there's always that up and comer that is always trying to grow their channel that, you know, they might be the person to come in and kind of, you know, take those questions on themselves. And I've been trying my hardest to try to promote the smaller channels to keep them pushing whenever I see people trying to do good for the community. I'm like, hey, maybe yeah. you want to check this guy out because it looks like he he might uh, um, solve the thing that you're looking for. So I'm not just trying to keep it about myself. I'm trying to allocate a lot of this stuff around to other people that, you know, are just looking to come up as well and do the same thing. I absolutely love that. And I love that's how long you've been doing experience uh, like where you've been in the industry for, because I'm not going to lie. Since I've been joining, you know, you said people were gatekeeping. But since I've joined, I've never met anybody gatekeeping. But it is funny because I just kind of when I started, it was always with the, you know, on the Internet. So the whole YouTube and tutorial, it's always been kind of like everything's online. So you might as well just share it around. Um, which is crazy. You know, you doing tutorials and being somebody that's a leader and sharing knowledge. What are some of the key things you'd say make for producing a good tutorial? I would just say keep it authentic. Like right now, I have like a good setup, right? Like I have my lights, I have my black magic camera there, the stuff in the background. Like that stuff just came over time of me doing it. Mm. But just like Andrew was saying, like you're using your iPhone for a webcam, like I started off with my Samsung Galaxy Note phone and I had like a lamp or whatever, just shine it down. Like I pretty much just used what I had at my disposal and I just slowly started implementing this stuff into my site as I was starting to make money on YouTube. I would just use those funds to allocate into buying like lights and cameras and things like that. I know a lot of people hit me up saying like, oh, you're lucky you got all this stuff. Of course it was easy, but it's like, no, I started with what I had. I just had my cell phone. And even if you don't have a good cell phone, just use your screen capture. Like if you want to share something, a lot of times I tell people the content is the main star of the show. Like I'm just here to give the information, but really the people are coming for the tutorial. A lot of people try to make it into like a whole TV show production. And I'm like, that's not what it's about. Yeah. Even with my what up, what up, sometimes people are like, oh, man, can you just get to the tutorial? I'm like, all right. Can we can we cut one what up? Just make it yeah. what up? You know? <laughs> I mean, I've had the comments where they're like tutorial starts at 0. 0.09 seconds <laughs> in. It's just like. Right. It's like you're already prioritizing putting it within the first 10 seconds of the video and it's still not. Right. So you can't Um, win sometimes. I also kind of want to fold this a little bit into, uh, I know you just got back from DAT. Oh yeah. Do you want to share just a little bit about how you got into maybe attending some of these tours or events? It sounds like you go to a lot of different industry events and maybe, you know, what you enjoy about speaking at them. Yeah. So even before I was doing YouTube, like actually the VR stuff is what got me into doing um, public speaking. Like this was Adobe Max 2016. I got asked to come out to because I worked on a VR project with Mixmaster Mike and it was starting to win some awards and stuff like that. So Adobe had invited me out to just talk about the project, which I was scared to death because I'm an introvert, right? Like <laughs> most artists, like I just kind of keep to myself. And so that kind of helped me break out of my shell because once I got through that presentation, I'm like, you know what, this isn't so bad. Then people are coming up and they're asking about After Effects to VR workflows. And, you know, I'm just having a ball talking to people afterwards. And so I was doing a lot of conventions after that, you know, WMAX, SIGGRAPH, NAB, um, GDC, just, you know, doing the toxing stuff. And then once I started doing YouTube and actually put my face out there a little bit more, that kind of leveled it up to where in like the companies, you know, like Maxon and Epic Games and whoever else can now put a face to this content out there. So they're asking me to come out and speak on their behalf at different conferences. And that's kind of where the design and animation tour came through. Like Maxon said, like, we want to have you teach, you know, Cinema 4D to Unreal Engine workflows to the people around the world, because it's going to be a world tour. Would you want to headline or co-headline with EJ and Chris Schmidt? So I said, absolutely. And it's been a blast, even though all those questions that I said before, those really deep questions, you guys have been saving them for me out there. So <laughs> you've been saving them for when you send me a person. Cause now like, they're like, now that we have you cornered and you can't just, uh, yeah, yeah. I've, <laughs> I've gotten I cornered a few times after I got off the stage. They're like, yeah. So, um, I asked that question about blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it's like, oh man, now I can't get out of it. But yeah, yeah, no, it, it's been a lot of fun though, meeting everybody in person. I think that's been the best part for me, just putting faces to a lot of the screen names, you know, a lot of people that are repeat commenters on a YouTube channel and 
social media and being able to talk to people in real life has just always been, you know, fun for me because it feels more like a community now. It's not like me just talking to the camera. Your last post was, uh, and I'm just going to quote you if you're okay with it. Yeah, yeah. I've worked on huge movies, Emmy winning TV shows, and even worked on a few video games, but nothing is more fulfilling than traveling the world and teaching others how to do your craft, which I think is part of why you are such a, uh, a gem in this industry and like why so many people are probably aware of your work is because I think you do have that, you know, it's not, it's not just words on an Instagram post. It's clearly something that you're, that you're living every day. So um, again, no, just want to say appre you. appreciate that because I think I've learned from you. I know Mikey's learned from you. You know, people at our meetup, everyone knows who you are. It's like, did you see the last Windbush video? Did you do, you know? So it's it's really uh, always uh, talking. Awesome. Gotta bring me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, where are you <laughs> guys meeting up at? Uh, we're in Brooklyn. Uh, we do in, uh, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah, kind of Bushwick area. So it's like right on the of uh, um, Bushwick and Ridgewood. So. Right yeah, I'll make, I'll make it a point if I'm in town to hit you guys up. I definitely would love to stop through. Second Wednesday of each month for anybody living in Brooklyn. <laughs> so <laughs> It's so nice to not just be somebody talking to a camera and get that face to face time. And, you know, the community aspect, I think, really is one of the greatest parts about our industry. Just I've yet to really meet like a true just asshole. Like everybody is always so nice and so kind and you know, it comes with that sharing knowledge and information because we always all get stuck on a project and you kind of need help. And so just through being in this field, you have to be right. humble. I want to ask you being on these shows, um, traveling the world and all of these things. How much is it sometimes if you said Adobe came up to you or Maxon, do they ever kind of give you like, can you talk about these points like X, Y, Z? Or is it something where they're just literally like, we're so glad to have you, you know, just come on and be you and talk about whatever you want. I mean, for the most part, most um, most places have been pretty good. Like, you know, they say like, we're here, we're hiring Wimbush to talk. So we want you to just do your thing. I only had probably one incident where it got a little bit weird and that's funny because you said adobe but i spoke at adobe max during the pandemic so everything was being live streamed but yeah, um, i remember that they asked me to talk about cinema 40 to unreal to after effects workflows and that's exactly what i did and they're like you spoke about unreal too much and i'm like well you guys asked me to speak about this <laughs> they were like yeah you should have spoke about after effects a little bit more which i mean i get it it's adobe but they were cool about it at the end of the day but that's the only one where it got a little bit weird when they gave feedback and even with like paid content and stuff like i always use it first before i try it out like you had mentioned move ai they brought me on board during their pay, um, paid campaign to try it out but you know i pulled all the old iphones out tried it out and it's like holy crap this thing actually works and so it's like of course you know i'll do something like that i've had instances where people have sent me junk and i'm just like i, I can't do that <laughs> you know because if i go out there and say like hey check this out then people check it out then it kind of puts a, a blemish on your name so i try not to do that type of stuff well and it's funny you were mentioning earlier too about the like uh you know putting your face on a tutorial i just saw uh Haley at motion hatch was recently doing a big mm. breakdown of uh oh, is it the one with ben yeah sorry ben Ben. Yep, I saw that. Talking just about like building, you know, we all can see Ben and, and recognize his face. We can all see you and recognize your face, like building trust, right? But the second that you start right. doing that, to your point, it's like everything that you talk about and everything, you know, if Ben Marriott gets on, gets on mm. and says, this is a product that I bought, you should all go, buy well, not you should all go buy it, but it's great. And then you buy it and it's crap. It's like, that's, you know, that becomes a uh, a, de a detriment to the trust that he's built, you know, it's in the same way that all you're right. building on your YouTube channel. So I totally get that. And honestly, thank God, because... I feel like uh, those kind of trends can get, especially in like the social media age, it's just like that stuff can catch on like wildfire. And it's like the last thing you want is for everyone to go out and buy something. And you're like, uh, it's actually terrible and I don't like it at all. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's, it's a thin line to cross, right? Like, you know, like I've been doing stuff with Rococo for a while and I think they're like a great um, entry level motion capture suit. But yeah. sometimes people go in with the thoughts of, I'm just going to get this suit, jump in and not have to do anything on the back end. And it's like, I try to say like, Hey, you're going to have to do clean up there. And I've had people try to call me out like, Oh, Wimbush Light, like this motion capture suit isn't this, this, and this. I'm like, no, you do. You have to do work. Like it, not everything is absolute. And even there is a product, I don't want to say the name, but like, I actually still use it to this day. This was a couple of years ago. And then um, Linus Tech Tools did 
a review of it and they just trashed it like they absolutely trashed it and i'm like it's not that bad and people all the comments are like oh man go check out linus's review he kept the real wimbush's line i'm like i'm not lying i'm like i'm using this thing i'm like it's pretty dope <laughs> and like i'm pretty i'm pretty ignorant of the the nuance here but i isn't also uh linus Linus Tech Tips is having a bit of a moment right now, from what I hear. Yeah, he is. Uh, yeah. So uh, get your product reviews from Winbush only. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> Working with so many big clients and, you know, just amazing films. If you could work on anything, like what would be your dream project to work on? Well, it would have been the Spider Verse, either the first two, but yeah, it didn't happen. So <laughs> oh, I do yeah. have friends that worked on it and they did a tremendous job. But also EA just announced that they're working on a Black Panther game, uh, yeah. video game. And so I thought that might be pretty dope. So I'm actually going to try to throw my reel over to those guys and see. I'm like, I just want to be a part of it, even if it's just animating the EA logo at the top when you turn the game on. I'm like... I'd be totally happy with that. So <laughs> I just want to be on it in some type of capacity. But I'm not going to lie. I'm a massive Spider-Man fan. And uh, the Spider-Verse was, whoo, that was so good, man. I was, yeah. I, there was just every little shot was just a cinema tile. Like it was just a masterpiece, like yeah, from especially start the, to beginning. So the beautiful. most recent one is crazy. Mm -hmm. Just like they really pushed it. Like I wasn't sure how they were going to be able to top the first one, but I'm like, they, they went all in on this one. So yeah. I can't wait to see the next one that comes out. But yeah, those guys that it, it was crazy. The amount of like, you know, the frame skipping and the different art styles all colliding together at the same time, they just mesh it like it. Never really see anything like it, even though Ninja Turtles is pretty good, too. I love Ninja Turtles. I'm actually kind of curious, too. I feel like there's now this this non photorealistic push uh, that's happening. I feel like for yeah. years, I mean, for the years that I've been involved with 3D, uh, like the last decade, photorealism mm -hmm. has always been sort of the penultimate. You're striving right. for that. You're striving to, to tr basically trick your viewer into thinking I'm looking at a real image and it's not 3D. Um, and I think we've sort of hit that. In a lot of ways, we've hit that. There are certainly some yeah. uncanny valley moments here and there. But I especially feel like after the Spider-Verse stuff, and even really, you know, not to bring it back to the AI stuff, but now that we have AI that can generate these, you know, photorealistic images, would not be surprised if the next 10 years is going to be this, like, very cool, off-the-wall, like, resurgence of just really intricate art styles that are not photorealistic that yep. are blending different types of 3d like when i saw t the teenage mutant ninja turtles movie come out and it yep. was not the exact same style obviously as spider verse but kind of in that vein you're like okay something you know something might be happening here yeah and i like i saw the movie when it came out and i was like okay this is dope this is something i could get behind because like i like stylized works like you know i've been in the industry as long as you guys and I felt like the reason people pushed photorealism was because it was always hard to achieve. Even back before GPU rendering, it's like everybody was striving for photoreal just because photoreal just seemed like it was just out of reach. And so once you got it, everybody got excited. But I feel like we're at the point to, like you said, it's kind of easy to hit those photoreal points, especially with GPU rendering and with AI and everything. So I think now we're going to see a resurgence of stylized art forms, which I'm all for, because I think mm. that's a little bit more creative than just try to recreate stuff that we already see every day. It's like, you no, know, let's push the boundaries, play with color, play with compositing, play with frame rates, and let's just really push the limits. Because to me, that's the stuff AI is not going to be able to replicate. And that's how we're going to be able to keep pushing forward creatively and keep your jobs. And you were saying too, like you've designed logos, right? Like at the, you know, so many, so many times I think we forget like motion design, design is in the name. Yeah. This idea of this pushback to photorealism also becomes a pushback to fundamentals of design, which I'm not saying aren't present when you're doing photorealism, but I do think that what you focus on in photorealism becomes a little bit more of like pixel pushing in a lot of, right. you know, a lot of situations yeah. as, as, you know, less so focused on you know, form, composition, balance, uh, you know, contrast, color, all of those much broader topics. It's not that they're missed entirely, but I think when you see really good NPR work, like, uh, like the Spider-Verse stuff, you're like, this is right. mastery of design just across the board. It's kind of sad that you have to exaggerate it that far as Spider-Verse for it to get any type of recognition, because I've seen people do stylized stuff, especially on social media. In the first comments you see people say is like, oh, that doesn't look photo real or 
that doesn't look real. And it's like, they weren't trying to make it look real. Like they were trying to express themselves in other manners and just kind of play around and be creative. And so it's not till it went to the extreme as Spider-Verse that people are like, oh, everything doesn't have to be photo real. Like you can play around right. with colors and all these different things. So I'm just hoping this kind of broadens everybody's horizons a little bit and we get away from that. Everything has to be photo real or try to attempt to be and just let people be creative. I mean, I would love to see more of it because just to your point, like, I don't think we see a lot of that stuff in like advertisements or even like broadcast or anything like that. So yeah, it would be cool to see a lot more of that influence happen in the type of stuff that we do as motion graphics artists, because then we could play around a little bit more in our playground. I love talking with people that have experience in VR. What do you think are some of the big hurdles that VR needs to tackle in order for it to become mainstream. The first thing is storytelling, right? Because if if you can keep your audience engaged, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. Like I know a lot of people want photo real because they want to feel like they're in Ready Player One. But also on the flip side, you know, you see people playing like Roblox and Minecraft and mm -hmm. they're in there because they're engaged with the stories that they're user generated stories. Like they're just creating them. So if you could create something immersive like that, I think people would be a little bit more forgiving on a graphical side. And then also the cost of entry barrier, like you have the Quest, which I think was doing good, but they actually rose the price of that recently. And then you have the Apple headset that's coming in at like 3K, which I think is ridiculous. Like that, that's, <laughs> you're really going to have like a niche audience for that. But it's kind of yeah. like you want to bring the barrier to entry down as much as you can, not like raise it up past to where the vibe used to be. So to get mass adoption, you're just going to have to make it affordable at the end of the day. And I think it, the people will be forgiving about the graphics, even on lesser powered stuff, if it's cheaper, if they could get in for a hundred bucks or 200 bucks or whatever, and, you know, just be able to meet with their family members, you know, communicate, have like your social hub, things of that nature. I don't think Facebook was it just because they have a bad reputation, even though they tried to change their name to Meta. It's like they told people <laughs> that they were changing, instead of just coming out with a separate product and naming it Meta, they're like, hey, we're Facebook and now we're Meta. It's like, no, you're still Facebook. So, it's going to, I think it's going to take a whole separate entity that people know nothing about because then there's going to be no trust issues there as well. And mm. yeah, it, it's going to take a lot of those different things and it's going to have to all come in perfect harmony. In the next few years, do you see yourself going more into VR or where would you, uh, you know, if you had to place a bet, like where you'll be landing in five years, would it be more of like an art director or just rocking out on more YouTube videos, doing amazing tutorials? What is the future of Windbush? Retired and doing tutorials. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I get that Fortnite map that, you know, matches a couple million bucks and you know, there we go. do tutorials full time. But like, I'm really liking the direction of where they're taking Fortnite right now and having a user generated content and trying to make it easy for anybody to go in there with a good idea to be able to just create what they want. And a perfect example, somebody um, recreated the Holocaust Museum inside of Fortnite. So you didn't have to be at that physical location. Like everything is there. And as you know, Fortnite has like 400 million concurrent players every single month. So that's a massive audience that you just brought that museum to that people around yeah. the world could come and experience it. So, I mean, I've even seen people run Fortnite on their smart refrigerator. So it's like, there's no barrier to where people can jump in and it's a free application, right? So anybody can download it go in there. And I think that's the powerful part of it. So I want to try to build out experiences that, you know, I can hit that user group and just, you know, make really dope stuff that people enjoy. For anybody listening, um, Fortnite is known as just a fighting action game, but yeah. it does have, a, so they're not, um, but it has other experiences. This isn't like a they recreated the Holocaust Museum oh, yeah. for a great <laughs> battlefield. <laughs> right. So yeah, I should, to top it off, it's called uh, Fortnite Creative. And so this is a whole other experience from the Battle Royale. So Fortnite, as everybody knows it, is a 100-person Battle Royale. Everybody shoots it out till there's one person left. They started something recently called Fortnite Creative, where it's all user-generated content. So you can have a map where you have absolutely no weapons at all. Like you just go in there, hang out, have voice chat, have text chat. Yeah, you could just have a good time in there. So it's not only action shooting experiences like people are making a whole lot of stuff like museums mm. and 
racing games and there's a lot of stuff going on over there so i would suggest just checking it out because yeah a lot of people are doing really cool stuff over there it's like an sdk developer kit where you put it into your unreal and then you can use like their characters and how their physics engine and all of those things right like that's kind of how it works and then you can easily upload it to a multiplayer engine versus having to build your own back-end engine on your own you know server you can just put it right on Fortnite, and then like that night we could be playing it right yeah you have to check out the um so for the dat tour that's something i've been building out so in each city i've been telling artists to send over the artwork whether you know it's pngs or if it's sculptures or animations and Mm. i'm building out a gallery myself and it's going to be the design and animation gallery so anybody around the world could come and they could see everybody's artwork maybe we could have art shows and stuff but that's another aspect of being community together inside I guess we could call it the metaverse, right? Because everybody could go in there. You have your own avatars and everybody's experiencing this unique area at the same time, which I think is really cool. You are speaking Mikey's language so much right now. <laughs> yeah. Mikey, uh, so during the during pandemic in VR chat, uh, there oh, were yeah. like VR chat meetups uh, at one point yeah. through XR. But Mikey has I think been working on slash definitely talking about for a long mm-hmm. for as long as we've been doing XR motion. Um doing a uh you know a community gallery somewhere like the vr chat yeah. might have been where we initially were talking about it but um, it, this it, idea mm-hmm. of being able to consume other people's art uh you know and i think with nfts uh, that becomes a slightly different thing but just take all that out of it just as a place to hang out and be like you know i, I made this animation i made this sculpture i made this design and being able to see it and interact with it in a space like that is i mean it is a very cool idea yeah, yeah, I love it. I, I was working on something. It was like an XR meetup in VR chat. And I right. tried to do the like uh, anybody can sit the their model. And I had kind of like these little capsules that where you could see everyone's art, their 3D art. But the thing was, I was running it on Unity because you have to for VR chat. Right. And so it can't handle the millions of polygons. And I'm not gonna go ahead and rebuild everyone's 3d model just uh it it was so it became a little bit more of a headache having an engine already built like that with the fortnite creative plus having it in unreal that i feel like is going to be a fluid beautiful experience and i'm i'm very excited to check it out you're definitely going to have to hit us up and we'll blow it up whenever that launches do you have any maps currently or anything that you know, I could go online tonight or anybody could check out. Not yet. I've been spread all over the place. I have maps that I'm working on, but nothing's been published yet. So it's like for me, I want the first map to represent, you know, the Wimbush brand I've been creating to the top that I can. And so, like I said, I have the design and animation gallery that I'm working on. Um, I have a project I'm working on with um, Method Man of Wu-Tang Clan, like recreating a, wow. a comic book shop <laughs> because... That's how he taught himself to read was with comic books. Like he's a huge comic book fan. So I, um, I've been working with him on his comic book and I'm like, why don't we bring this together on Fortnite? And he was all about it. So that's something else I've been working on in the back end. And then, um, Damn, that is trying awesome. to do, I can't wait for that. Yeah. That, that one's coming along slowly, but I want to make sure it's just right before I throw it yeah. out there. Right. And so it's one of those things. And then, um, mix master Mike working on like a concert experience with him inside of Fortnite, which I think is going to look pretty dope. So it's like, I want, I want it to be big whenever the first map that I drop comes out, I want it to represent me correctly and not just throw something out there just to say I did it. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Mm. That's peak work ethic right there. And just being able to to recognize that in yourself, I think is huge is, is not, uh, you know, in a world full of shiny objects, sometimes just making the shiny object isn't, isn't the thing to do. You know, it's tough seeing everybody throwing their stuff out there. And I'm just like, oh, let me just make something. But I'm like, no, let me, let me stay on the course and do it correctly. I think that's going to have a bigger impact at the end of the day. It is funny for like building these 3D worlds. You don't even realize that, A, you know, you're not just looking at visual experience, but how the interactivity that players are going to have in the environment, which is just like a whole different part of your creativeness. I love it. You know, it's very cool. And, you know, and then it has like that 360 element. It's like you're not just building the front end of it. Like people can go all the way around each little section and it's just so much more you have to think about and so much more creative, different problems. You know, it's, it's, it's awesome. 
that comes from the the years of VR training, right? Because I know when we first dove into it, when I make an experience, like I, I treated it just like it was an HD video, right? Like everything is happening right in front of you. And then you see people looking all around and there's nothing going on. And I'm just like, oh yeah, you can't just think about what's in front of the person. Like if they want to be immersed, they want to look around and see what's around there. So you kind of get into that thought process of building environments, more of just mm -hmm. building flat screens, which... I think that um, a lot of that VR training is really helping me trying to build these immersive experiences inside of Fortnite. I remember I had like some spheres in my VR world. People just wanted to pick them up. I was like, you can't pick them yeah. up. I don't, I don't <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah. Well, I guess before we hop off on your touring schedule, what kind of events do you have coming up? Is there anywhere people can come out and see you? Do you have anything you wanted to sort of call out that you have coming down the pipeline in the next month or so? I would just say, first and foremost, you know, the YouTube channel um, at Jonathan Wimbush, the best place to find me at. That's where I've been trying to do weekly tutorials, at least, you know, it's been a little bit tough with the schedule, but the next stops that I'm doing, um, I'll be in Seoul, Korea next week, um, speaking at Korea University there. And then I come right back to Chicago doing a half rest festival there on September I think that's September 8th. So anybody in Chicago come out. I went to it last year. That's a good time out there. And then, um, yeah, it's still pending. But November, I should be going out to Europe. So like London, Paris, and I want to say Hamburg, maybe. I have to look back wow, at the yes. schedule again. But trying to hit some of those European cities because they don't get a lot of events out there besides um, IBC. So you get a lot of people mm. all the time saying like, can you guys bring something out here? And it's like, you know, we'd love to just got to get the sponsors on board. So trying to hit all the places that don't get a lot of community stuff going, you know, because, you know, we're lucky we're in L.A. and New York. So yeah, we, get, yeah. we get everything. But a lot of these cities <laughs> we've been hitting, you know, like Nashville and stuff like that. They're like, yeah, we don't get anything like this. So everybody shows up and it's a good time. That's the common theme I've noticed in every city I go to. Like, I'll always have one person that would just say, like, oh, you know, I'm shy and I'm an introvert, but I'm trying my best to get out here and network, and I don't want to let this opportunity pass me through. So I think it's cool that, you know, people are trying to come out of their shell, especially coming out of the pandemic. Like, I felt like if you're introverted before that, that really, like, doubled down on how much you didn't want to get out. So it's cool seeing people come out but, and you know, the communities it are nice, you know? So don't be scared. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it's funny the pandemic note exactly. too, not to not to overstate it, but I actually think the flip side of that being the pandemic kind of leveled the playing field. Like everyone yeah. came out of the <laughs> pandemic with like a little bit of social awkwardness and like not wanting to, you know, I mean, just that's the symptom of it, right? So if if you haven't done it before, it's like now's as good a time as it's gonna get. I mean, it's every every event you go to, it's people are like, this is my first one since you know COVID, or it's the first time I've been able to get out in a couple years, and so. Everyone's in the same boat, and yeah, it's just to echo your guys' points. It's it's always a great time, and everyone's very welcoming. So, um, yeah. exactly to that point, Jonathan, thank you so much for giving so much of your time today. Um, it's honestly such an honor for you to even come on the XR Motion podcast. We've been talking about it for weeks, and super pumped that it actually all came <laughs> through. So, appreciate yeah. you spending time with us. Uh, no, thank you guys for having me on. Like I said, thanks for being flexible around my schedule. But yeah, it's been fun.